Terreno Adriatico Stage 7, a sprint stage from San Benedetto del Tronto, 159 kilometers long. Typically, this last stage was the time trial, but they flipped it, as you know, this year. The first stage, which usually was the sprint stage, was the TT. There was some medium mountain, nothing to worry about in the first 80K, then pancake flat on the coast. They do some circuits of this seaside town, which doesn't uh, shine anything on the Gold Coast. Gold Coast and Australian beaches still undefeated compared to European beaches. But as you can tell, not the most exciting stage from the sound of my voice. Um, it was going to be a sprint, no GC action, decent weather, headwind in this sprint. And Brake got caught with Fellini, I think, or Buaro. They're the same person, and Arcas. <laughs> what do you see from Pog got on the front, Benji? Was he doing a lead out for Ackerman? Is Ackerman still here? Uh, he is still here, but I wasn't expecting too much from that man in this race. And I'm surprised that they were, to be honest, but they were trying to set something up. He was doing some work and it's probably to show that he is also willing to work in races where it's not that important for him anymore. And therefore the people that work for him will be more likely to, uh, work harder or feel better when working for him when it actually matters. Like the same thing that happens with, um, I swear I said this like this week already where someone was working for someone and like even with the Demko and Jakobsen thing, Jakobsen worked for Demko, for example, in one of those races. That's the kind of stuff I mean. And that's the kind of stuff that Pogacar is doing here for Ackermann. I'm not certain that Ackermann will be very helpful in many of the stages that Pogacar is leader at this year, but yeah, I guess he's doing it for that reason only. Now, when it comes to the setup of the sprint there, uh, we've seen the finish line a few times in the stage as it's that loop. And it didn't look like the most straightforward finish. It was kind of technical, some narrow sections in there. So it could be chaotic. But in all honesty, they got through just fine in the first few sections. But you know that the last time is going to be much more impressive. And with about 3k to go, I was seeing already problems for a lot of the bigger teams. Like... We know that quick steps here with Cavendish, and honestly, quick step from 3k to go. I only saw Osgreen at that point in the race. They were, awful. They <laughs> they were, were awful. not at the front. And Lotto Sudal, same story. Ewan's not here anymore, but they were not sprinting for uh, him this time around. I think they were sprinting for, was it Kluge on the stage? It felt like it because he <laughs> yeah. was sitting in the last wheel of that train. And they did the same thing with Kluge as they do with Ewan, which is basically trying to put him in the front of the race with. Two and a half kilometers to go and let him figure it out. But it doesn't work with you. And how is it going to work with Roger Kluge? So, yeah, that, that didn't go as planned, I'd argue. What teams did you see uh, as the strongest ones in the final two and a half kilometers? Well, FDJ said it's like you can take an aerial shot at two and a half Ks, three Ks, and be like, this is brilliant. Five men in Damar. And then 500 meters later, you're like, where the fuck is FDJ? Like, they just get swarmed. Israel, I think Dowsett did an incredible pull today. I think Dowsett was yeah. he, typically he's third last man. He's he doesn't says himself he has no interest being there in the last kilometer. Well, he was second last man, and Israel have been going too early in sprints for for two years now. They've got Nitzola here, and Dowsett did his best. He brought Zabel to like five hundred meters through this twisty chicane and. It was impossible to move up in the last uh, 700 to 400 metres to go. Impossible to move up. Koi, you could already tell. Koi sprint, impossible to win. Yep. Cavendish, impossible. Merlier, impossible. Too deep, 25 wheel. You, you, it's not happening at that point. The problem for Nizzolo was we got a headwind in this sprint and Zabel was left on the front. A little bit early, they were missing, say, Impy second last man to really bring them closer. And But there was a power vacuum, Benji, and it actually turned into a complete mess. Like, who was there? Well, we got Muschietti, DeMar, Bauhaus. Anyway, I'll cut to the station, we'll analyze the sprint afterwards. Um, it turned into a complete shit show, narrow sprint. We're in Italy, we're not allowed to have just normal, safe, straight sprints with wide roads. And Caden Groves sprinting it trying to get a clear air demar boxed in by christoph christoph didn't do anything wrong on the barriers and it's Bauhaus who jumps out at the last minute and nails nitzolo nitzolo having a sprint into the headwind for quite a while 
and yeah, it's not the most exciting sprint stage, but I think that's Bauhaus' first ever uh, World Tour sprint win, Benji. So he proved me wrong. Oh no, he won Polonia Is last it? year. Yeah, he won that sprint where he almost buried Olaf Koy last year in Polonia. But uh, in this sprint, we indeed saw that Israel was doing that setup on the left side. And it looked like it was Pasquale on that actually did a really good lead out for Christoph, in my opinion. And that allowed Christoph to move past Nizolo in the final stretch and kind of block in Nizolo. And that's the moment that I think was key for Nizolo to losing his race as well. Because from that point on, you need to wait until Christoph passes him and then he's able to pass. But by that point, people are in his wheel ready to go over him. So uh, that's where he loses the momentum, I think, to get something out of this. But he's also not been as strong as previous years, in my opinion, this year either. We saw that that Coffee the Sprinter was on the right, also trying to get something out of it. And the thing is, you see Demar and Bauhaus almost in the same position. Demar is in the wheel of Christoph once Nizolo already passed. Christoph and Bauhaus is roughly in that position as well. And they both make a different decision. Demar chooses to go in the small gap that doesn't exist next to Christoph on the left There's side. no gap. And Bauhaus chooses to go the entire other way of the road. It's a, a big move, but I'd argue he didn't endanger anyone. Groves did have to move up a bit to the right, but I don't think I saw anything sketchy in that move by Nizolo personally, uh, by, uh, by Bauhaus, I mean. But um, that's the difference in decision-making. Decision Bauhaus went for the open pot on the right side. It's risky because if he doesn't have the time to pass everybody on the right by the time that the finish line comes, he's not going to make it. But he's able to stay in that draft significantly. He he goes to the right at the exact right moment because that track sprinter moves back at that point. And if he had waited two seconds later, he wouldn't have been able to move to the right because that track sprinter was there. So perfect timing in that move. And that's what allows him to slingshot past other people. And yeah, we see some people of those sprinters, like you mentioned, like a Koi, a Medlir, and a Cavendish in the background coming closer and closer, but you won't win anything with that. You need to be in a better position when it comes to the sprint starting, and that was not the case here. Cavendish on paper has a decent lead out to bring him to these places, but it wasn't there today at all. And when it comes to Merlier on paper, he's got a decent team around him to bring him to the front as well. But is Ricard even here? I think he's out of the race, or was it? He's out of the race. race. He was sick. Oh, no, no. Sorry. Yeah. He actually said he had a dead leg. Like he. What? He, he, yeah, so when he was pedaling, he like was having nerve sensations in oh, his leg. Yeah. Um, and see, so you, you want to get that checked out. I've actually had something similar. So it's good to get that he's getting that checked out. But yeah, it was it was a, me, a mess. Merlier looked a shadow of himself this week without a perfect lead out. During this stage, I basically just hopped on, did Tour of Autopia stage two on Zwift flat stage, um, which was pretty good. So if you want to check out Tour of Autopia, stages two through five are still coming up. Our show partner Zwift, and yeah, I've been enjoying knocking out an hour basically in race mode, watching the races, and <laughs> certainly today's stage was a good one to do that on with Bauhaus taking the win head of Nizzolo, Groves, Chimelai, Dainese, Christoph, Bosenhagen, Koi Demar, Moschetti, Malir 11th, Cavendish mm, didn't contest like or sprint properly 31st. So yeah, good win for Bauhaus. I completely made up that he hadn't won a world tour race before. He'd won three before today. Um, just <laughs> quite a while ago. <laughs> he just won so many Saudi, Crow race, Hungary, Slovenia stages that I forgot. Yeah, but like I'd argue that Bauhaus is not a first or second tier sprinter, he's third or fourth tier even. But it's benefiting from these situations that allows a sprinter like this to win. A situation where other sprinters aren't positioned well, where he's able to position himself well and therefore can gain these victories. And uh, I'd say all the power to him if he's able to achieve it because uh, the others didn't today. Yeah, I agree. He's just, you, you got to be in it to win it. And I'm guilty of it when I'm ranking sprinters. I'm like, well, Ewan's the fastest in ideal conditions. So Ewan's the best. In Italy, we don't have ideal sprint conditions or perfect runways <laughs> or whatever a lot of the time. And so you have to account for who can win in a messy sprint today was, and who wants it more. Bauhaus wanted to win this stage and was. Cl- is always going to is willing to risk something more than Cavendish for a Toronto Adriatico stage seven, and that matters. And you want to take a fifty fifty risk, etc. I do think Demar is looking better. I, I think Toronto quite encouraging yeah. for FDJ with Pino and Demar. 
Um, they just got to get their leader sorted. Um, Agree. For and Lamar. it wasn't even that bad for Demar today necessarily. He just had a bit of a. I'd argue that he was in a decent position to be competitive. Yeah. But he just had the odds against him when it comes to his decision to go to the left. And also next to that, the fact that Kristoff stayed with the barrier and so forth. So the tiny details in a sprint, it's also part of luck, I dare to say, at some point. Pagancha takes out GC, of course, nearly two minutes ahead of Jonas. Lander third. I think that's a good... Jonas has to be happy with that, with the pretty shit yeah. TT at the start of the week. To come second, I think he should be happy with that. Out of, yeah, as I said, Lander, Port fourth, Hindley very good, but these are huge gaps in a one-week race. Three minutes. Yeah. Aaronsman, big points for DSM, 175. Sixth, best GC result of his career, I dare say. Caruso, seventh. Pino, eighth. Belbao, ninth. And Ciccone, tenth on the 403. Avonapol finishing 11th on 420. Uh, Pozzo. See, this is the thing with Pozzo Vivo. He still, still picked up 50 points yep. for 13th. I didn't see him once a week. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that was Trento Adriatico. It was not nearly as interesting as the race last year, unfortunately. But that's, as we had that discussion the other day, additions, ebb and flow. Um, yeah, it just it just wasn't as good as last year. Anything else to say on Trento, Benji, before we do Drenta? Not really. That was it for uh, for Tirreno. I I enjoyed the race, but it was clear that one rider was better in GC than the others, and that came true throughout throughout the entire race. I think that Roglic and Pogacar should be a. Uh, it shouldn't be legal for them to ride different races all year. Agree. Ronde van Drenthe, 156 k's. It's a world tour race for the women. It's they do the Vanberg. It's like the, a few times, and it, the last rep, the 500 meter rubbish dump climb in the Netherlands, 4.2 percent, is with 13 and a half k's to go. It was all about could teams like Jumbo Visma and SD Works put Lena Vivas under pressure. We know she is out and out the best sprinter in the world. We have Trek here for Balsamo, uh, the world champion. Bastianelli is in magic form for UA Team ADQ. And that is what happened on the Vanberg. Uh, I think it was Rihanna Marcus pacing really hard on the Vanberg, trying to put DSM under pressure. And then a group of uh, Anushka Costa, Sarah Roy, who had crashed, and a couple of other riders went clear. But DSM Benji, the women's team is the opposite of the men's at the moment. They they're just dialed in. Fight for Georgie on the front, chasing that back. Yep, indeed. And it's it's something we saw last year, like you mentioned again. And it seems like when it comes to the Van Berg, it's weird because Wibbers on the cobble hills in the classic sense of forth, I'm more scared than when she arrives at the Van Berg, for example, in the Ronde van Drenthe. And I think it's perhaps because the Van Berg is so far apart in this race where you've got the time to recover in between and not necessarily directly have to go up the next climb or what do you see as the thing in this race that makes this more possible than a race like i don't know an example here a brug de pollen necessarily or well can do him yeah but i think she can actually achieve that at some point true um it's probably what you said like there's so also and probably not the strongest teams at Trenta last couple of years like she won last year and dsm could boss the race like if there's voss van vlerten and co attacking yeah. on van Berg, i don't know if five for george is bringing that back so i think that plays into it as well but yeah that group got brought back hosking was working for Bolsamo, which is Bolsamo faster in a flat sprint than hosking well i'd argue yes I have more confidence in Balsamo than Hosking personally, as in consistency at the moment. Yeah. But it's also prettier if she wins in a World Champs jersey. <laughs> True. <laughs> uh, it might be a form thing as well. Like last year, I think in one of those Norway stages, like Hosking is very, very fast, but maybe she's not in top form. Balsamo's maybe in better condition right now. But she was working for Balsamo leadouts, lining up, for Ronde van Drenthe, but unfortunately, 
Like her strike rate is incredible. We've mentioned this many times. She's one of the most valuable assets in cycling with the stage one of the Tour de France fam of X Swift coming up. If you go to a finish with Renna Vibas, you're going to lose like 90% of the time, except when Bolzano beat her, I think, in women's yeah. tour last year. And she got the lead out. Uh, no, not really, actually. She just came off Hosking's lead out of Bolzano, jumped ahead, and just destroyed everybody easily. Once again in the sprint, no, they even gave her a one second gap ahead of Bolzano, which I'm not sure about that. Uh, Kopecky third, she said the best she could do is third behind those two burners. Clara Coponi fourth, Bastianelli fifth, Alice Barnes sixth, Consoni seventh, Nina Kessler eighth, Yip van den Bosch ninth, and Roy tenth, which was pretty solid after that move and also, I think, crashing. But, yeah, I just think Lorena Vibas is, is still the best sprinter in the world in the women's peloton and there's, there's not much more to say in that regard. Yep. I think, yeah, any, any other surprises here, Benji? Caponi, a pretty good result. Yeah, I feel like Caponi has been, uh, outside of that tactical thing at the end of La Samer, a very consistent rider this year, 15 Omelope, 16 Hageland, 15 Le Samer, and 4th in Ronde van Drenthe. It's a matter of time before she gets to a moment where she can actually sprint for a victory against sprinters that are not necessarily the whippers of this world. So uh, I'm uh, I'm high on Clara Caponi, and uh, yeah, she's one of my favorite female cyclists because she's a young rider, 23, uh, first of all is on FDG, so not necessarily the strongest team out there, which is also a a part of me supporting outsiders and she's also consistent enough to believe that she can actually break through at a certain point and make that move we saw her in was it women's tour last year where she got four top five or something something like that so it's a matter of time and i'm eagerly waiting to see that pay off in the end fifth in om loop this year third in women's tour gc last year a win is clearly coming she just keeps running into Vibers and Bastianelli Norsgaard. I think I think she's going to take a win in like Tour of Norway sprint, something like that, coming up this year. She's at Danilith Nikita Kursa in a few days, midweek. That's a strong field, by the way. We will see there Kopecky, Bastianelli, Vibers doing it all again. Grace Brown, Voss. That's one to tune into. A stronger field relatively compared to the men's race. Susanna Anderson on You Know X, they're there as well. So, yep, that's one to watch. Uh, we'll have, I think we'll have a note on the results from that during the week. But yeah, that was a big week of cycling for me and Benji. An easier one next week. As I said, we have Milano San Remo preview dropping in midweek, then the big monument on the Saturday. Otherwise, we'll, uh, we'll maybe set up an interview or something, but no promises. Hope you enjoyed all the coverage last week and we'll see you later. Ciao.